Okay, so I wanna go over quickly, I guess there's nobody in the room. Uh, I wanna quickly run through some of the early history that's occurring around the origins of psychology. So we know one of the factors is going to be the Industrial Revolution. So uh, if you're not that aware of it, we're talking about urbanization occurring. So people are moving into cities for one of the first times in human history on a large scale. So that's gonna have an impact, right, on social classes, on population density, on demographics. Uh, it's gonna alter human interactions. Uh, it's gonna create new social systems. So we could probably see how that might lead to a social desire for psychology. Now, there's other factors involved in this, right? There's a lot of social class change. If you think about people who are working in factories, if you read into this, uh, field of study at all, uh, maybe about their feeling about life, going from being people who at some point, maybe their grandfather, someone was related to farming communities, and now massive urbanization is creating a change in what a human life looks like, what a human lifespan looks like, and what it means to be a human, maybe what makes you fulfilled as a person. So we're going to have massive shifts there. It also creates changes for that lower class, but also having an upper class that dominates that group, and that's going to play, play out a lot in some of our later information. Okay. Um, so we want to think about changing social systems, changing economic systems. We have changing uh, gender roles as women are moving into the workplace uh, in some of these areas, but still doing some of the same tasks generally. Instead of sewing at home, maybe you sew in a shirtwaist factory now. Uh, so those things are occurring, okay? Um, but alteration to what it means to be a person and also mechanization and kind of repetitive processes, if you think about that as having an impact on human life. So another thing occurring at this time would be the biological theories of Charles Darwin. We want to keep that in mind. So we get evolution, and that's going to be important, natural selection in terms of evolutionary psychology. So there's a whole branch of psychology about how the human mind has changed due to ways that we have needed the brain to work in order to survive. And so that's going to be a piece moving forward. Okay, and we're going to apply that. Also, people asking questions about why humanity might come to dominate the earth, uh, whereas there's so many different animals out there, and a lot of exploration has occurred through the 1800s. So places... Uh, and, and interactions have increased. Uh, also due to industrialization and technologies, you have more immigration and migration of humans. So people are interacting uh, from different cultures on a larger scale. Okay, awesome. So we've got industrialization, we've got Darwin. What else? Well, imperialism is taking place. So your European, Western European countries, uh, particularly the British, the French, uh, Germany later, um, the United States, but a lot of your Western European countries are getting involved in imperialism. Really, it's everybody um, that you could think of, okay? Um, this is going to create massive problems. Uh, you get a world that is dominated by Christian Western Europeans who are able to pull and extract resources through uh, coerced labor uh, from peoples around the world. And you get this oversimplified fake science view that's going to come out of it that we would call social Darwinism. So this is going to be used in two ways. We'll have a social Darwinism that explains that, oh, well, if I'm a factory owner and I'm wealthy uh, over in this area, then I'm going to use that to justify why you as the factory employer, employee should listen to me. But we'll also see it applied on a global and international scale in that white uh, Europeans will look out at people of color around the world and they will try to use social Darwinism to explain through fake science that somehow they have a superiority to other people around the world. And imperialism is happening globally, okay? By 1820, we have the British in India um, seizing control. By 1850, you have uh, the opium wars taking place in, in China. And if you want to see something horrendous that has long-term political ramifications, go look those up and the unequal treaties that took place afterwards uh, and examine the impacts those had. Um, you had uh, the United States sailing into ports in, in Japan and opening them up. You had the United States in South America uh, with the Monroe Doctrine. And we, you know, we've seen colon or, uh, you know, colonialism in, in South America for a long time at this point. And then by 1885, you're getting into um, the Berlin Conference and then the scramble for Africa in the early 20th century. So really, imperialism is taking place on a global scale to people. And so consider all of these happening around psychology when early psychologists start to write, speak, and think. This will have an impact on 
who is involved in psychological data collection, who is involved and educated in early universities in psychology, who is writing the founding works in the field of psychology, and who they are studying when they're preparing these works. So early psychology is going to have a bias. So as we're considering this, go back and check out the video and think about science, technology, okay, or science, technology, and society. And think about how these are interacting. So in this case, we've got some technology driving a change to society. We've got a society demanding a science. We've got a fake science influencing the way people are thinking in society that we'll see in phrenology and also in social Darwinism. And obviously technologies are coming that will shape this science. But consider these relationships and how these social factors are going to influence early psychology. Hey, thanks a lot. And also as you move forward into discussion, consider how these factors would be influencing uh, early psychology.